Hi, everybody. Welcome to Ask Me Anything number four. I love doing these. Uh, we got a lot of good questions ahead of time. I'm going to do my best to get through those. But I also want to say that um, by far my favorite thing about doing these is what people put in the comments and like what people say in the chat that is always hysterical and really good. So uh, definitely ask me questions in the chat, even though I'm going to be going through the backlog of questions I already got. The, the thing I want by far is to encourage engagement with the random weirdos who are watching. But to get things started, um, I'm going to go to some of the questions I got ahead of time. Let's start with the Valentine's Day question. Here we go. Question the first. Um, <laughs> oh, wait. First, look at this. My afternoon work productivity just got cyber attacked. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, your cyber security was woefully inadequate. I uh, had no trouble getting in there and cyber attacking your work day. Um, all right, cool. Let's look at the Valentine's Day question. How do I get my girlfriend more interested in pedals from Daniel Bingert? Uh, well, you know, it depends a little bit whether uh, your girlfriend is a musician. It's going to be easier if she's a musician, probably. Uh, I would say if she's a musician, give her a pedal as a present. <laughs> you know, pick pick something that you think would help her be creative and cool. Um, you know, pick out something that will let her like have fun and and create cool new things like don't just give her your favorite you know what i mean um if she's not a musician you know it might be a little harder you might have to um i, I would say you really got to make sure your like boyfriend service is on point you know like are you giving her presents where you like write and record little songs for her are you doing that you know can you give her like a Valentine's Day present that is a song you wrote or a cover of her favorite song? And then you use some pedals on that. And then you can tell her about the pedals you used on it. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't promise that that's going to get your girlfriend into pedals. But on the other hand, the fact that you have a girlfriend at all means that you're in the top one percentile of pedal shitheads. So look on the bright side. Uh, next, Mr. Dream. Oh, shit. It's my man, Cyberboy. Hi, Mr. Dream. Nice to see you again. Oh, favorite polyphonic synth master sequencer. Love you, boy. I, I love you too, James McCarron. Um, you know, I, I don't, I only have one polyphonic synth. <laughs> I only have one synthesizer at all. It's the OP1, and I love it. I, I use it for everything. Um, I'd like to play more synths. I'd like to do more synthesizer videos. I'm aware that I have like kind of a big part of my following is synthesizer people. I love you guys. I, I, I wish I had more synthesizers so that I could relate to you better. Um, but all, all I have is the OP1. And I also, I use, I use GarageBand sometimes too. They're like the little MIDI synthesizers that they give you in GarageBand. S some of those are kind of good if, if you're willing to have them sound like video game bullshit which is exactly what i want so um i'm sorry i'm sorry i don't have a better answer for you that's but that's my honest answer although all, on the other hand like all i'm ever trying to do with guitar pedals is sort of make the guitar sound unrecognizable and synthesizer -y. so you know there's that like the c4 synth pedal from source audio like that's pretty serious um so, you know, I consider those my synthesizer babies as well. All right, let's do another backlog question. Um, uh, okay, here, here's one. Here's one that's sort of like representative. Do you like elephants? God likes elephants from sr this was submitted to me ahead of time now i get questions like this i don't know if this is like a reference to something i i don't know or if this is just like a brute force random thing i think it's just a brute force random thing but i honestly don't know if like this question means something completely different i i get a lot of this <laughs> i get a lot of this where i i'm like happy for the engagement you know, thank you, SR. Thank you for giving a shit about my Ask Me Anything and submitting a question. But part of me is also like, like, what does this mean? And does it mean 
You know what I mean? Is is like is this some sort of like storm the capital thing? You know what I mean? Like was SR were they saying shit like that when they at the on January 6th? Were they like, do you like elephants? Is that one of their things and their codes? I, I don't know. I wonder sometimes. But I'm assuming it's not that. Um I'm assuming I'm just, I'm just gonna take it at face value that you're really asking me if I like elephants. I do. From what I understand, they're like very intelligent and like mourn their dead and like have good relationships with their kids and like have a culture. I'm not kidding. But like my understanding is that like elephants have a rich emotional life. Um, you know, and when I hear shit about like people killing elephants or whatever, I think that's I'm on the elephant side. Okay. <laughs> Anyone who was ever killed by an elephant, I, I think the elephant was right to do it. There's a hot take. <laughs> there's a hot take i'm sorry if people are watching this we're like well my parents were killed by an elephant and it was the grave injustice i'm sorry i'm sorry if i'm alienating those viewers but i'll say it again i think anyone who was ever killed by an elephant the elephant was right to do it that's how much i think that elephants are good gentle creatures and then the next thing god likes elephants okay well that that's consistent with what i'm saying uh you know what I get questions, things like that make me wonder what does God not like? What are what are the creatures that God made that he does not like? Right? You know, like did he make like it would be funny if he sort of made like you know, I don't know, when he made like otters at the end of that, he was like, Man, that one sucked. What can I do? I made them already. Uh that's the that's the best I can do. That's the best I can do with this question. All right. Um, here's another. Oh, wait. I, sorry. I got <laughs> what guitar pedal should I give to an elephant? Great question. Great question. I'm going to take a similar, similar line to the girlfriend thing. You know, anything that you think would help that elephant be creative. Talk to the elephant. You know, if you guys are not talking to your elephants and like trying to get their perspective on things, you, you know, there's nothing I can do that's going to help you. You got to you gotta find out sort of what the elephant is trying to do or what the elephant is interested in and then give them a pedal that's going to help them with that. Are you a more Mars Volta fan? If so, what's your favorite album of theirs? You know, I, I'm a fan in the sense that like whenever I hear Mars Volta stuff, I'm like, yeah, that's cool. But I don't I don't know the albums. I don't have a favorite album. I'm sorry. I mean, everything I've heard, they seem super rad. But I'm I, I'm not able to have a conversation about Mars Volta albums with you. I'm sorry. Do you if do you want to recommend your favorite? You want to tell everybody in the chat what your favorite album is? That would be cool. All right, here's another one I got ahead of time from um, Aulo. Question is: If you were to recreate the soundtrack for a very bad movie from the '80s, which one would it be? Now I actually had back and forth with this person about the question because I wanted to make sure I got it right. The question here is not, sorry, what was the question? I asked, are you asking me whether I just redo the soundtrack and this bad movie from the 80s doesn't have the soundtrack it has anymore in its place it has the soundtrack I made, it is whatever I make? Or are you saying I just recreate an existing soundtrack and I follow it, but I recreate it with like my instrumentation and it's like I release it as an album? Which, which thing do you, which question are you asking? And he was like, well, why don't you answer both questions? And I was like, okay, good plan. So uh, so then I thought about it, and it's actually hard. I don't know. I mean, just 80s movie soundtracks, The Terminator is my favorite. I would love to recreate, not replace, just redo. T just take Brad Fidel's awesome score and then cover it. I would love to cover the Terminator soundtrack, but that's not a very bad movie. In fact, I consider that to be one of the greatest movies ever made. So it's just what comes to mind when I think about 80s movie soundtracks, like the Terminator comes to mind. And I actually did cover the main theme in one of my videos already. Um, I, uh, in, the, in my video for the bitmap, I, one of the five pro tip songs in that is the Terminator theme. But I, there's other, besides the main theme, there's everything on that soundtrack is awesome. But in terms of bad movies, you know, I don't know. What's a bad movie that has a good soundtrack? I mean, this is kind of a hostile answer, but part of me wants to say Return of the Jedi. I mean, I don't really think that movie is a bad movie. But with everything that happened afterward... 
sometimes I think Return of the Jedi is like closer to Phantom Menace than it is to Empire Strikes Back. I'm I'm not saying that. I'm saying sometimes I wonder that. I also I haven't seen it in a long time. Maybe I would love it. Maybe it's just like so absurd and kitschy that I would love it. But one thing's clear: the John Williams soundtrack, I'm sure, is great. So that could be fun. It could be fun to redo that soundtrack, like cover, the, like keep his ideas and just redo them with my little bullshit. That could be fun. Um, but in terms of like redoing from scratch a bad movie, you know what? I bet there's some like early Jackie Chan movies that would be fun for me to score. I bet I could have fun with like a really early what the fuck is going on, low production value Jackie Chan movie. That that could be good. Um, what's a recent trend in music that makes you want to talk mad shit? You know, I, I'm not going to have one of these. I, I feel like Rick Beato has got this covered. He's, I'm not going to be able to do as good a job as he does on this exact question. Um, uh, yeah, I, look, I don't know, man. It, it recent, I, I feel like the trends that I don't like are not necessarily recent. You know what I mean? I think it's weird that jazz guitar players don't have like a good bend vibrato. That's like that's not a thing that jazz guitar players do. I think that's weird. I think it's weird that like gypsy jazz musicians are like obsessed with imitating the style of this one guy Django Reinhardt so obsessively that some of them even only play with two fingers I think that's weird that's a trend that goes back like a hundred years a recent trend you know I don't know I, I guess um I, 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 I don't know I don't I, I try not to be I, I feel like nothing makes you sound like an old more than like getting worked up about new music and how much worse it is than the music you like. So I avoid that at all costs because I'm, I'm not, I don't want to come across like a disgusting old. So it just as, a, as part of my like presentation of myself, I, I actually make a point like not ever to answer this question in my own mind. But I also feel enormous pressure to deliver on these for you guys. So I'm going to see if I can think of something for you. What's your name? Wrapped in gray. Uh, recent trend in music that i don't like yeah i don't know man i don't know recent everything i can think of that i don't like is like is old um i'm really sorry maybe i'll think of another one later you know what could help if you want to like identify some recent trends that you think are sort of controversial and i'll tell you if i'm like hot or not on the recent trends how about that um Steven Byer music. I love that your favorite gear video is Fantastic Flaws by Knobs. The general philosophy behind that video is what I strive to implement in my music and songwriting. Well, cool, man. That's why you and me get along. Uh, yeah, there's a YouTube channel by this person named Knobs who you might have heard of. He's he's like a great YouTube pedal guy uh, called Fantastic Flaws. It's literally my favorite gear video that's ever been made. I watched that video and and when it was over, I was like, I don't need to make videos anymore actually nobody needs to make videos anymore like he ended it <laughs> that video is just like it finishes the whole thing like there's there's not nothing else anyone is going to say or do with any pedal from now on is like really going to break new ground because what he says in that video is just like that's all there is to how to work with this if it sounds kind of crazy and impossible that any video could do that you just have to watch this video and then here's another thing I have a cool, exciting thing happening with knobs on this YouTube channel in the near future. But that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, just make sure you subscribe so that you're notified when the cool, exciting thing that me and knobs did together comes out on my channel. Uh, favorite soundtrack focused recording artist. You know, I said before that I, I try not to come across as like a disgusting old, but that's probably over because I don't know what soundtrack focused recording artists are. Are you telling me that there's like people whose whole career is just doing soundtracks? I mean, I, I guess I knew that. I guess I know that film composers exist. Are you just asking me who my favorite film composer is? Is that is that what this question is? Because if so, you picked kind of a funny way to say that. If like we're just talking about fucking Hans Zimmer or something. Or are you saying that there's like young new artists who like release a little bit of original music and then do like a bunch of movie soundtracks and then go back to putting out like a rap album or something. I don't, I, that's the thing that happens. I don't know who any of those people are. <laughs> um, uh, 
Oh, and sorry, follow up from Raptin Gray. Definitely less interested in rah rah top forty, the industry Beattle rants, and more interested in rock guitar specifics. But fair. Well, thank thank you for seeing my cop out answer is fair. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I don't know trends in rock guitar that I think are um, that I make me want to. I'm going back to your question. I'm going to try again. Get them back on the horse. Question is. Recent trends in rock guitar did make me want to talk shit. Well, I, okay, one is just like imitating shit that people already did. I just, when I hear like, I mean, I've talked in the past about one of my issues with John Mayer is that he's like trying to just redo the blues songwriter guitarist thing that I feel like was, was we were all set with that. And then he came along and was like, no, I'm going to do it. I don't like that. You know, when I hear new music that is just like trying to do 80s glam metal again, you know, like whoever, whoever like the newest version of Buck Cherry is, I just feel like I like I like some of that music. Van Halen is my favorite band of all time. But like, how are you going to try to make an updated version of Van Halen? that's better than Van Halen. Like Van Halen tried to do it and they weren't unable to do it by the end. So, and now you're going to do it. I just, I don't, I don't like it when I hear rock and roll music that was like, Hey asshole, do you want to hear some shit? That's just like everything you've ever heard, but we're going to do it from 2002 or from 2022. Is this is a new one. I just see now I'm getting worked up in the way that I try not to get worked up. But anyway, um, th there's, there's an answer to your question. Uh, <clears throat> watching this as i work my boring corporate job okay my heart goes out to you alex a 10 out of 10 the editing in your videos is always so good thank you how did you get into it and is it hard to do um all i was doing with the fancy editing stuff was just reusing stuff i had on my computer for making my own music videos that's where it all started my youtube channel didn't start out as a pedal channel it started out as i'm an independent musician named cyber attack with my original music and I was putting original music on my channel. And I was putting out music videos for my original music. And uh, I sort of like developed this aesthetic for the music videos that had like weird video game assets and action figures dancing around. My friend John Marty helped me with all this. And to this day, he helps me. He films the action figures. He's this filmmaker. You should look him up, John Marty. Um, so I had a bunch of action figures and weird glitchy graphics on my computer from the music videos I was making. And then I just decided to do a gear video and I just used that stuff. Um, is it hard to do? Well, yeah, I, I, you know, I had, I got better at it. Also, by the time I made my first gear video, I had already made a couple music videos and figuring out how to do that was definitely hard. Uh, I mean, it's just like anything else, but I had to do it over and over again. One thing I like about doing the pedal videos is that like, I have to crank out so many of these that I end up getting good at it kind of fast, you know, because I just have to bang up pedal videos. And I do I do that faster than I make music videos because I, I consider music videos to be my real work. And those are the videos that I care about more. So I'm like way more uptight about them. But the fact that it takes me longer to make one because of how uptight I am means that it actually takes me longer to get good at it because in order to get good, you have to like finish something and put it out and then come back to it later and see what the flaws are. So if, if you like make two music videos in a year, you know, it takes you a while to figure out what you're even supposed to be working on. Um, all right, look at this. Bear McCreary is a strong contender for best recent soundtrack composer. Okay, thank you. I'm glad we have that in the record now. Every, did everybody catch that? Bear, the answer to the question is Bear McCreary. I wouldn't have known that. Um, Knobs is great. I'm absolutely in love with Blooper and recently have used it a lot in my composing. Awesome. Glad to hear it. Um, oh, I love this question. What the hell is that guitar with the horse inlay behind you? I thought you were an SG and red strap man. Well, <laughs> uh, this was a guitar I had made for me. It's the horse logo. Here, here. isn't that cool? This is the guitar. Uh, the horse logo, it's made by... Iron Horse Instruments in Orangeburg, New York. It's made by a guy named Alex Glasser. You, you can look him up. Uh, but Alex Glasser's company is Iron Horse Instruments and the logo is a horse. Um, yeah, I am an SG and a Red Strat guy. I, I have an SG and a Strat. I love both of those. This custom guitar 
that I had built for me that was supposed to be like the dream instrument. I, I a little bit was trying to have it be a Strat and an SG in one. I tried to do that. So it's like Strat scale length and um, has like a single coil pickup in it, but has a SG style neck joint. It's a set neck and has um, mahogany wood. So it's, it's like SG wood. And I, I sort of tried to have it be the like both, like depending on which pickup I use, it could be either one. And I don't think, I don't think it is that. Uh, it sort of has its own identity. It, it, it's, I think it's a little closer to SG than Strat. Um, for instance, in a pedal video I have coming out that you haven't seen yet, uh, one of the songs I do is Hell's Bells by ACDC. And I use this guitar for it. And I think it sounds like when I was listening back, I was like, oh man, I, I wasn't even really trying to nail it. Like I never worked that hard to recreate someone else's guitar tone, but I actually thought like that's, I got kind of close to the, to the Gibson ACDC sound on my little hell's bells thing. So that makes me think the guitar is more kind of towards SG, but it's also kind of snappy and bright and it has an ebony fingerboard that it has those things. Cause that's what I was trying to make the strat sound happen. It doesn't sound like a strat really, but it does have a snappiness that SGs don't have. Um, is this interesting? I mean, I'll, I'll tell you about my custom guitar that you will never have because there's only one and I have it. <laughs> I'm happy to tell you about this guitar that you, you, you'll never get to play in your entire life if that's what you want to know. But I, I feel like maybe we should keep moving. Th thank you for indulging me, though. Thanks for giving a shit about the expensive custom guitar I had made for myself. Um, have you done any vids for the Astral Destiny? Yeah, I'm so glad I'm able to say yes. Yeah, look on my channel. Click on the little CyberTech YouTube channel icon and go over to videos and search for them because one of them is about Astral Destiny. I hope you like it. That was an early one that I made. Um, Biggie or Tupac? For me, Biggie. Uh, for, for me, Biggie. I mean, nothing against Tupac, but you know, notorious B.I.G. was my era. Uh, and I and I, I love I love some of his songs. I mean, I know Hypnotize is the obvious one, but I really, really love that song. Uh, so that's my answer. Uh, this is the freak jack of all trades. OK. Oh, you're talking about my guitar. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I've mentioned in a couple of previous live streams. I'm catching up here. Um, do you gig? I, yes, I do. Although I haven't since Plague World started. I mean, but pedals, the pedal shit only happened for me because I stopped gigging during Plague World. And now I don't now I don't know if it's like safe to do it again. I know some people are doing it again, but I'm still sort of when it comes to live shows, you know, unless all 6000 of my subscribers live in New York City, I'm like still kind of a local indie guy, you know, so I, I can like fill a room. But it's the room has to be like Rockwood Music Hall. You know what I'm saying? Um, so yeah, I don't know. I haven't played, I haven't played since Plague World started. I, maybe it's time to do that again, but I'm also kind of not in a rush because I know people feel differently about large indoor gatherings. And I kind of, I was already sort of asking people to support my thing. Like that's what gigs used to be before Plague World. It was like, Hey, can you come to my show? We're friends, right? Will you be my friend and come to my show? Like that, I was living in that world. And now it's like, you go back to that, but then also, you know, Omicron. So I, I kind of just don't want to stress people out by having to make, one, do I want to be friends with Ivan after this decision? Two, d you know, do I want to risk also getting the terrible plague? Like one, one of those would be enough, but both together, I'm like, eh, I'm, I'm going to wait for things to cool down a little more. I really don't want to spend 1K on an OP1. Did you find one secondhand? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. But not being able to afford an OP1 is an exciting opportunity because unless you have zero synths, it'll just force you to investigate the synths you already have and you might find some cool shit there. So not wanting to spend money on an OP1 is good news. You know? And even if you don't have a synth, you know what you should do? You should try to get some like, find a browser synth. There's like really shitty synthesizers that is just like a website. You can like go, I don't know what they're called. Google it. 
where you just like go to this website and it gives you a synthesizer you can play with in browser. You know, it's not going to be able to do any of the things you want a synthesizer to do. But spend some time on that. Like, see if you can become like better at the browser synth than like people would ever expect you could get. And then do something interesting with the browser synth. Like, this is how cool shit happens. It's like you can't afford an OP1. You look for the cheapest, worst available alternative. You wind up on some shitty synthesizer website that sucks. And then you get good at that. But clearly, this is a cool place to be. Okay? That's my advice to you. Hey, dude. Nick here from Brazil. Hello. Your boss, Harmon, his video is something from another planet. Congrats. Thank you. It absolutely changed the way I use my board. I'm glad. I'm glad. That was the first gear video I ever made. I hope you watch some of the other ones because the editing and the playing in that one I did in like one day and it kind of sucks. I'm glad you liked it though. Um, related to squeezing a strat into an SG, thoughts on tweaking an SG like Frank Zappa? Look, I, I don't really know. I'll be honest with you guys. Like I kind of don't... <sighs> I don't have the relationship with guitars that I have with pedals. Like with pedals, I kind of just feel like, you know, I'm like super technical and I like try to get really sophisticated and explore the like outer limits of what's possible. And I try to get the weirdest sounds I possibly can. On a guitar, I kind of just like pick it up and play it. And I also feel like most guitars kind of sound good. Like anytime I pick up some like cheap Squire piece of shit that like is supposed to suck and cost like $99, I pick it up and I'm like, hey, this isn't so bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I obviously I can tell the difference between a good guitar and a bad guitar, but I kind of don't think it's that big a deal. And I also think like, this is me being a snob, like you should just be able to make a guitar sound good. You're just supposed to be able to do that. Like you should be able to have any shit guitar and plug it into a shit amp and find something that sounds good. You should you should be able to do that. Now, not everybody can do that. I get it. But if you can't do that and you just got fixated on being able to do that, like you would be fine. If you can do that, it, you, it doesn't matter what pedals you get. And it doesn't matter whether you have Frank Zappa's SG or not. And it doesn't matter if you have a this kind of an overdrive instead of that kind of overdrive. If, if like you really, if you want to take the hardest possible route through life that as a musician, then you should just say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to reach a point where I could pick up any shit guitar and find something to play on it that would sound good. You, then you're going to have a real easy time with your pedals from then on. So obviously I like well-made guitars, but I kind of don't, you know, all my all the guitars I have sound different, and I never even know which one is my best one. Or like when it's time to make a record, which one do I use? I, I never know. Because anytime I play any guitar for 30 seconds, I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, I'll just use this guitar. And then I'll switch, and I'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, this sounds fine. You know? I, I know that this makes me sound like kind of a ditz, but I'm just being real. Also, this is another reason why how a guitar looks is extremely important to me. Because like... I feel like the distance between how good they sound is not super far. So looks matter, you know, like I'll, I would never play a Steinberger guitar ever. You, you could magically make the best sounding guitar in the whole world. And if it was a Steinberger, I just wouldn't play it. Cause I think that thing is so hideous. I'm talking about those little tiny black guitars that have no headstock and the body is just like a little black chode. I think those things are so unattractive that I'll just never play one. I don't care how good it sounds. It's not going to be that hard to find a guitar that sounds fine and looks better than one of those. So that's my question for that. Is there a pedal out there that you thought was just too complicated or difficult to use? Um, you know, the closest I ever got to that was the C4 synth from Source Audio. Uh, but I, I ended up loving it and figuring out enough of it to be able to do stuff with it i love and that pedal is now can do some irreplaceable things um i was intimidated by it but i i just hung in there and by the end um i i was in love any more of those more known guitar <laughs> Are you saying like the last couple of videos I've done have been less known guitar pedals? Is that your grind? <laughs> Jeez. Okay. I, I mean, 
all of these companies are like you know moving thousands of products like i didn't it's not like i'm going to my fucking next door neighbor and asking him if he made a pedal um but yeah the answer to your question is yeah not only that not only that but i have um in the next like month and a half you will see two new release pedals on my channel also so not just and they're well-known companies plus i have another video coming out that is not about any one pedal i'll just tell you i'll just uh, this is a spoiler i have a video coming out that's basically going to be like all pedals how to be advanced it's basically like how to be advanced with any pedal in the world and so i'm going to be using a couple different brands to illustrate various points in that video and the brands i choose will be the biggest brands i know would you ever want to design or develop an effects pedal yes i i would i have some ideas about this i'm actually just waiting for my channel to get a little bit bigger before i pull the trigger on this uh but yeah i have some ideas i have a really 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 low tech idea that would like be really sort of not hard for anyone to do and wouldn't require like a company to build a whole new sort of production infrastructure. Like it would be the kind of thing that would be easy for a pedal person to make one of for me. So like low investment, uh, I already have the idea for it. I'm just waiting, you know, I'm waiting for the channel to get a little bit bigger. Oh, Hey, okay. I'm, I'm like a little bit behind with the comments, but Joseph North, did you see that wrapped in gray is now talking to you directly in the chat asking what you're looking for in a synth? Did, uh, Joseph North get get on wrapped in gray and let him let him talk to you. See, look at this. Lots of other options than the OP one. He he knows the answer. I did not know the answer. This guy knows the answer. I sampled your voice. Oh, all right. Well, good luck. Good luck. You know, I I'm I've always been a little self conscious about my voice, so I really hope that you, you do something with the sample that sounds good. Chili Peppers are touring again. Gonna see them maybe. <laughs> I don't know why. I think that's really funny. <laughs> why is that funny? Why is this comment really funny? Chili peppers are touring again. Gonna see them maybe? Question mark. There's something about the kind of like, I don't know if I give a shit about this at all in the question itself that is funny, especially with the Red Hat Chili Peppers. I'm, I mean, I think I'm probably not gonna see them. I, I have liked the Red Hat Chili Peppers. Um you know, when I was a senior in high school, I I sort of went back and like discovered their earlier records. And I was obsessed with Mother's Milk for a while in high school. And I also I like the record no one likes. I like the Dave Navarro record, One Hot Minute. I think there's some cool stuff on there. Um, I, but I think I'm not going to see them. You know, at a certain point, the Chili Peppers. I'm going to talk a little bit of trash here. But, you know, I just said there's albums of theirs I like. And they're, you know they're managed by q prime they've sold a bazillion records so clearly if there's anything they're doing that i think is wrong they're right and i'm wrong but at a certain point <laughs> at a certain point they kind of started doing the thing that i think sounds like children's music and this is unforgivable for me there's a certain quality there are a couple qualities that you can get to in your music that if you get there, then I'm done with you. And one of them is it sounds like children's music. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Like there's a Red Hat Sweet Pepper song <laughs> where the lyrics are like, I got your hey, yo. Listen what I say, yo. I, 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 the first time I ever heard that, I was like, well, I'm done with these guys. I just, I refuse. I know that song was a hit. And I'm sure when they play it live, you know, they look out at 50,000 people singing it back to them. But I, I can't do it. I got your hey, yo. Listen what I say, yo. It, to me, that sounds like it, that belong. That's like one of the shitty songs on YouTube kids. Like, I just I can't I can't I can't I can't I just can't take that seriously. Uh, great free plugin synths, Cherry Audio MG1. See, this, look at this guy; he knows everything. The th thing I was saying before about free software synths, it, this is the answer. Look at these ones. Um, uh, have you heard of King Gizzard? Yes. What do you think of them? I don't have really have formed opinions. Just wondering about playing better on the other pedal videos. I really like when you play bad. I kind of search for that. Oh, okay. You like when I play bad? I'm not totally sure what that means. If you mean like when I take a bad sound 
and then make it sound good, then I'm glad you like those. Um, although, I, you know, somebody told me recently that I hide the fact that I can shred and that gave me major anxiety. That set back my like artistic maturity like 15 years. As soon as I heard that, I was like, why? Well, then I'm just going to start shredding more. The next pedal video that comes out on my channel has some of the most hardcore shredding I've ever done. And I did it because somebody said that. So I'm glad you like I'm glad you like when I play bad, but comments like this make me do that less. Can you talk about being in a musical rut and how you kickstart your creativity? Side question, what was the biggest waste of time for you as a musician? Oh, yeah. Did you submit this ahead of time too? I somebody sent me a question on Instagram. What's your biggest waste of time as a musician? Um so I don't know if that was you. Maybe two people had the same question. But yeah, th this is a fun one. I'm going to spend some time on this. Um, biggest waste of time for me as a musician, I think is probably, I mean, one, it's just procrastinating, like going on YouTube and just watching reviews of like video games that came out in 1991. That's irresistible to me. I'll see like, oh, here's some guy on the internet talking about a video game I've played to completion. I wonder what he thinks about it. And I'm like, don't click on it. We know what we think about it. We don't need to know. And then I'm just like, well, I already clicked it. Uh, so that's one. Another thing is that I spend uh, probably too much time listening to stuff while I'm working on it. Like if I'm working on a new song or one of the little songs I put in one of my videos, I'll listen to that as part of like the mixing process way longer than I need to. Especially if it's like I played something hard and it took me a lot of takes. And I was like, oh, I really want to get this. And then I have to like spend a lot of time on it. And then I finally get the take where it just sounds like I nailed it. I'll listen to that a lot and pretend that I'm working on it. And I'm just listening to my own guitar playing. I know this is disgusting. I'm just being real with you. I'll, I'll listen and be like, oh, I am good at guitar. I did it. Oh, I, I'll do that, which is a huge waste of time. I'll be like, man, we see when this one comes out, people are going to see that I can really play. And then I'll be like, you know, I wonder if Janelle Monet watches pedal videos. That'd be pretty cool. Uh, so that's that's one, one way that I waste my own time. Then to your other question, can you talk about being in a musical rut and how you kickstart your creativity? Sure. I, I mean, one way is like... Uh, a couple, couple things I'll say here. You know, one way to think about this is that the question of how to kickstart your creativity. One way to think about this is like people say there's no shortcuts. And I actually don't think that's true. I think there are shortcuts. There are shortcuts. It's just that like they're not free, but there are absolutely shortcuts. I'll give you an example. There's some YouTube video of BB King and U2. BB King and U2 did something together. And in the video, there's like footage of them talking. And at one point, B.B. King said something like, now someone else is going to have to play the chords because I don't play chords. And you two is just like, going, all right. They didn't blink. But, you know, for us watching on YouTube, that's like a real what the fuck moment. B.B. King doesn't play chords, huh? Now, now that's a shortcut. Like B.B. King just decided he's not going to do that. And so the stuff he is going to do, singing and playing leads he, he was able to get as good as he is at those things a little bit faster because he never really spent any time strumming chords. So like, that's an example of a shortcut. Now I'm not saying that BB King got good at singing and playing overnight. I'm just saying he, he got there a little bit sooner because he just decided I, I'm going to, I'm going to take a shortcut. I'm not going to play chords ever. Now that may or may not be an appropriate shortcut for you, but if there are things you're willing to lose, then you can get everything you want a little faster, you know? Uh, like, for instance, when I was learning, taking singing lessons, I just decided I'm not going to try to have a good melisma. Melisma is when you sing multiple multiple notes on one syllable. I was like, I'm, I'm not going to ever try to be good at that. Uh, and so I just had to write vocal melodies that don't do that, that are in my range that I can sing. And and that sort of forced me to write kind of simple melodies that are like sort of catchy and sort of work, even if they're sung plainly. Like what's what's a melody that'll work if, if you can't be Stevie Wonder? 
you know, actually that's sort of a good exercise because it'll force you to come up with a melody that is just kind of catchy and if done straight. So like that was a shortcut. Now I, it's not like I woke up the next day and was as good at singing as BB King, but however good I got, I got there a little bit faster because I took a shortcut. Uh, you, you see what I'm saying here? So one way to think about it is like, what what's something you're willing to lose and then how can you maximize everything else to compensate for that that's one way to think about it you know if, if anybody watching plays dungeons and dragons the name for this is min maxing or min max like when you make one thing minimum and you make another thing maximum so uh actually i'll give you an example that's not from dungeons and dragons um when i was a kid there was a nintendo 64 game called nba showtime it was a basketball video game and you could make your own basketball player. And they gave you all these different categories of attributes that basketball player could have like shooting, speed, power, stealing, pushing part, part of the game was like mortal Kombat style violence where you could like push somebody and take the ball. So that was an attribute and you, you couldn't fill everything up. Like they only give you so many numbers of points to allocate to the different bars. So you couldn't just make like a Michael Jordan guy who had, 100 percent everything you have to pick what you wanted but you can make a two-person team so one weekend me and a buddy both this both designed characters and i made mine full on strength and pushing and stealing and zero on shooting or dribbling and he made his zero on like health and fitness and strength and full on shooting and then what we did is I would just steal the ball by pushing the other people and then passing the ball to him. And then he could shoot from almost anywhere on the court and get the ball in. Now, if anybody laid a finger on him, he would fall over and lose the ball. And if I ever tried to shoot, I would miss. But we knew that. So we just played around it. And the whole game was now just I steal it and I pass it and he shoots it and he scores. We min maxed. You see, you see what I'm saying here? So you know see if there's a way for you to do that that's part one of your question um and then another thing to kickstart your create i'm spending a lot of time on this and i'm getting anxiety that the chat is filling up with a million other questions in the meantime i promise i'll get to you guys i promise uh let me just finish talking to calvin D dinverno um here's another way to try to kickstart your creativity uh this is like this has to do with how to rip people off effectively uh, there, there's a way to rip people off that is like cool and good and will it'll stoke your own creativity. The, the trick is to um, pick someone you like and then try to make the like most precise, most subtle, most like tiny focused specific observation about what you like about them and then rip that off, that tiny thing, rip that tiny thing off. And the tinier you can make the thing, the, the, the better you'll be at be, getting away with the ripoff because no one will even notice. Uh, let me give you an example. I like ACDC. Let's say I wanted to rip off ACDC. Well, one way to do that would be to write a song using like A, D, and G open string chords and play it through like a Marshall stack at mid-tempo. That would be a dumb ripoff. That that would be the kind of thing I said before. There's like new music that sounds like old music that I don't like. Um, everyone would just be like, well, that sounds like you ripped off ACDC. And guess what? Like, you think you're going to beat ACDC at their own game? Like, ACDC is not even able to make new records that are as cool as their best records. So, good luck. But but what if you what if you were able to make some like less obvious observations about ACDC, even if they're tiny things? For example, one ACDC thing is putting the big hit or the big accent on beat two of the measure. One, two, three, four. That's like a weird, cool ACDC thing. I'll give you some examples. The bell in Hell's Bells is on two. I mean, that song starts and you just hear the bell. So it sounds like it's one, one. You just hear gong, gong. And if you started counting from that, you would count gong, two, three, four, gong, two, three. You put it on one. But when the riff comes in, the bell's not on one. The bell's on two. 
it's just a, and it sounds cool it gives that riff like this extra sort of rhythmic acuity that's just neat um and they there were other examples of that this sin city riff gong gong dun 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 the accent is on two it's just it's just this weird ACDC thing that makes the riffs a little more interesting. If you can make an observation on that level, and then you, when you try to rip off ACDC, you're doing, well, let's put the beat on two. You know, one, no one's ever going to say, well, hey, you ripped off ACDC. But two, it'll just give you a more interesting thing to work with. They're like, here's another example. Stevie Wonder... What's the uncool way to rip off Stevie Wonder? Well, it would be to take a clavinet and play some funky blues scale riff and put that on a clavinet. And it's going to sound like superstition, right? A anytime I walk into a club and I hear the band doing some funky A flat minor blues scale clavinet thing, I just think, okay, this is like Stevie Wonder now, except you're not Stevie Wonder. I judge that harshly. That That's like not the cool way to rip off Stevie Wonder. But what's, what's a weird little tiny thing we could notice about Stevie Wonder? Well, one is that he uses the whole tone scale in a catchy way. The, the whole tone scale is like, I would have thought, impossible to make catchy. But Stevie Wonder uses the whole tone scale in his melodies in a way that is catchy. It's, he like does the impossible. There's whole tone scale in the beginning of You Are the Sunshine of My Life. The beginning of Sunshine of My Life is that little keyboard intro is whole tone scale and it doesn't sound dissonant and fucked up the way whole tone scale sort of does when you learn it it just sounds cool there's whole tone scale in um don't you worry about a thing at the end of the chorus before it goes back to the verse there's a little whole tone scale run and it just sounds kind of cool and there's whole tone scale in living for the city too da 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 that end of that is a whole tone scale melody now that by itself sounds a little weird but with the chords and in the context of that song he made it actually sound kind of catchy so my advice to you is if you like listening to music be on the lookout constantly for the tiniest little observation you can make about what makes a song cool and, and just constantly be scouting for this. The two examples I gave are sort of music theory-ish. And if you don't fuck with that, that's okay. You can do this on any level. It can be like Tom Petty always sounds like he's about to cry when he sings. Like that's how Tom, I love Tom Petty, but like the Tom Petty vocal performance is like on the verge of tears and then, but holding back the tears. Well, she was an American girl, raised on from this. She couldn't help thinking that there was a little more to life somewhere else. <laughs> I mean, I'll stop, but like, just this is what I want you to do when you listen to music. It's like always just be taking notes on, on what the tiniest little observation you can make about why you like it. And, and make it a game. Like, see how much more precise you can get every time you listen to anything. And then just keep a notebook in your mind of weird observations. Like, it's cool that ACDC always puts the big hit on too. It's cool that Stevie Wonder can fuck with whole tone scale and make it sound good. It's cool that Tom Petty is always on the verge of tears and he makes that sound good. Like, just build up this storehouse of other people's tricks and, and try to do it at a level of specificity that, no one's going to care if you then rip it off because other people haven't made those observations yet. That, that was a long answer, but that's, that's my answer for you. I'm now going to try to um, catch up with everything I missed in the comments. Ingve Moms, Momsenberger. Great. Love that comment. Um, one hot minute kicks ass. Who doesn't like Europe? See, this is shit that was like briefly relevant 35 minutes ago. <laughs> um, Okay. Oh, look, at, I love this question. What was the name of the NYC jazz teacher you took lessons from again? <laughs> Amazing callback to like AMA number two. <laughs> uh, Sean Driscoll. Everybody watching this, look up Sean Driscoll. He, if you're in New York City, he's a guitar teacher. He's great. I took lessons from him like recently. 
uh, he's great. But not only that, he has YouTube videos. Guys, I know you're going to be excited about this because I know you guys like YouTube videos. Look up Sean Driscoll. He has a video that's like metronomes, how to be advanced. He doesn't call it that, but that's what it is. If you like my how to be advanced videos, he did one, except it's about metronomes. Um, watching, watching that video will make you a better musician. His name is Sean Driscoll. Uh, that guy, I love that guy. Uh, what else? Um, oh, uh, okay. I'm just trying to catch up here. Thank you for all these great comments. Um, uh, yeah, some of these, I don't even remember what you guys are talking about. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, okay. This is a fun one. Any albums you think changed the game for you musically? Could you name some albums that got you thinking like, what the fuck am I listening to? Sure. Um, Melt Banana is a, is a band that had that effect on me. Um, they're a noise band from Japan. They, they you know, I, in my videos, I talk about using noise and we talk about bad sounds and we talk about doing shit that sounds kind of hostile and weird. I, I talk a big game with that. Melt Banana makes everything I do sound like a Disney movie. Like what, what I'm doing is so fucking PG rated compared to what Melt Banana is about. Um, but that was a recent one. Uh, you know, uh, Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness, that's the double album by the Smashing Pumpkins. That came out when I was a little kid, uh, but I listened to the radio obsessively as a child. I just had the radio going constantly, FM radio. And it was sort of a cool time to be doing that because like alt rock was mainstream successful. So like Z100 was playing like Smashing Pumpkins and Weezer. I mean, like Z100 is the station that is now playing like top 40, you know? So that means like Rihanna or whatever. And I like Rihanna fine, but just... In, in when I was like eight years old, that music was like Smashing Pumpkins and Weezer. So uh, I was exposed to all that stuff. And when and I liked the Smashing Pumpkins. But then when Melancholy in the Infinite Sadness, their double CD came out, it tr truly did blow my mind. One, I think those songs are awesome. But then two, it this was the CD era. And I used to like it when cds came with little books that like explained stuff i used to love reading that and i liked it when they had the lyrics too because I, I always wanted to know what the lyrics were and so i loved it when cd came with little books that had that information and melancholy and infinite sadness came with two books melancholy and the infinite sadness is the greatest like cd package that has ever been done as far as i'm concerned just the art direction is amazing but anyway there were two books one book was just images it was just pictures there were these like fucking psychedelic, weird, trippy collages of like bunny rabbits playing baseball and all the people in the stands were little babies or like two birds flying an airplane at night and there's like lightning. Like It was just psychedelic shit. And I was like nine years old. I, I just looked at that with like the full force of like a nine year old who was just letting it go like completely into their brain. Like it just went right into my brain. I was like, I'm just going to absorb this as fully as I could ever absorb anything. That was the first book. Then the second book had all the lyrics, but each song had like a little icon and it was in this like Smashing Pumpkins font that was cool. So just all of it, the songs, the books, I, that whole record was just like, it was, it felt like a world you could go into. That was amazing. Um, let's, what, uh, what else are we talking about here? Albums that changed the game for me musically. Let me see if I can think of something that uh, I haven't talked about on a previous live stream. I mean, there have been a lot of albums that kind of blew my mind. But let me see if I can think of someone who I haven't talked about before. Um, yeah, okay. I mean, Stevie Wonder, I already talked about him earlier, but I, I remember the first time I heard Higher Ground, the song Higher Ground. It, it was like, a, what the fuck is that moment? So that song just starts with like three different um, overdubbed clavinets playing these like really cool funky patterns, but they're three different patterns. And the way they sort of all interconnect, even though it's just three overdubs, it sounds like infinity. Like it's one of those things where like it's three parts that are different, but they interlock in this way and they're sort of spread out in the stereo space. 
and like the way it all comes together especially if you're like a nine-year-old kid listening on headphones it just feels like you're listening to infinity i i love that whole song but the beginning of that song when it's just the clavinets i would listen to that over and over and over again and like i would start the song and then as soon as the band came in i would just start the song over again and i would just listen to like the first to something like four seconds i would just listen to it over and over and over again and i i was i honestly didn't understand why anyone was trying to make any kind of music that was different than that i was like higher ground is the greatest sounding thing i've ever heard like we should just why are people trying to do other things like why is everyone not just trying to sound like what this sounds like over and over and over again. I got um, I got the Stevie Wonder Music Aquarium. It was another double CD that was like um, Stevie Wonder's greatest hits from like 1970 to 1980. I got that and only listened to Higher Ground for years. Like if you would ask me if for, between the ages of like nine and 15, if you'd asked me if I was a Stevie Wonder fan, I would have been like, oh yeah, with all my heart. And then if you asked me to name two stevie wonder songs i couldn't do it i was like i probably listened to higher ground 40 hundred million times in my short life and that's all i knew like i had the cd and i didn't listen to anything else for years and then and then when i finally did i was like oh everything else on this is also astounding um but yeah it, it's easy to lose track of how many different ways stevie wonder is an incredible genius like if just as a singer he's unstoppable and also i think notable for having a strong male melisma. When you get off your trip, like he can just do the thing where he sings a million notes on one syllable and makes it sound good. I, I don't think there's any male singers who have a better melisma than Stevie Wonder. So if he was only a singer, he would have been a star. Like if all he was doing was just singing songs that the Motown hit writers gave him, he would have been a star. Okay, except then he wrote his own songs and they're incredible. And so just as a songwriter, that's the other thing, is if he didn't sing and he didn't play, just as a songwriter, he would have also been a superstar. If he was the guy writing those songs and then he just gave them to other Motown artists, he also would have been a superstar. Specifically, his ability to write catchy stuff that is extremely sophisticated. Like Stevie Wonder has written as big hits as anybody and he's written stuff that is as catchy and fun to listen to as anybody. And he's hidden all kinds of insane sophisticated shit in his songs not i was talking before about whole tone scale he's used every kind of chord there is rhythmically he's like can syncopate and get as funky as good as anybody can if you have um like the stevie wonder greatest hits is like fun to listen to because those songs are great but if you get the albums his weird album cuts are fucking incredible like there's that song on songs in the key of life called contusion that is just this like jazz fusion assault it doesn't have words it's just like this instrumental jazz fusion attack i mean it's great um you know and then aside from that since we're here to talk about pedals like that guy's embrace of synthesizers and music technology is also incredible like the way he used synthesizers, he understood early on that like there's a way of coming at synthesizers where you can just create sounds from scratch and sort of design sound um the way he embraced that and you know that stuff is also incredible you know his his records and his synthesizer sounds have aged well you know th there's some synthesizer music that just sounds a little bit like olden times you know not all that stuff ages super well because sometimes it comes out and it's brand new and people think it's cool just because it's brand new but then tastes change and we don't really think some of those sounds are good anymore that's not always how it goes there are some sounds that are good I mean, this is something I say on my channel a lot. And it, you know, philosophically, it's sort of a dicey issue. I, I believe that there's like such a thing as good sounds and bad sounds on an absolute level. Sometimes people say stuff like that and it's terrible and wrong. Like there's Alex Jones shit about how like tuning to 440 is like bad hurts. And if you tune to 840, you know what I mean? That's like Rothschild controls that or something terrible. Some people who say there's good and bad sounds are saying terrible Infowars shit. I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm just saying I don't know how it works, but I do believe it's no coincidence that Stevie Wonder's synthesizer sounds have aged well. So uh, that's, an, that's another answer. Um, Stevie Wonder, is, uh, his 
the albums, but also specifically uh, the song Higher Ground just blew my mind. Um, uh, oh man, so many good questions here, man. This might be, this might be the time when I actually don't get to everybody. Um, oh geez. Some really good ones here. Uh, look at this. I bought melancholy from my neighbor's yard sale because he turned into a born again, Christian also bought I remember live those guys. I mean, uh, those guys have the neener quality. The neener quality is something my friends and I made up in high school. It's a thing that some bands have. I've previously said that Jethro Tull and Rush have it, and me and Live also has it. <laughs> that guy with this, he's like bald, except he has a little rat tail. And like all the songs are a little bit like, you, you need to chill out. Live's music to me is like the guy at the party who is like, somebody needs to get that guy out of here. You know, where it's like, I alone love you. It's just like, bro, 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 bro. Just whatever you're thinking or saying right now, stop thinking and saying that, okay? Your inner life is all fucked up and unattractive and wrong. So just go somewhere else and have other thoughts and say other things. That's how I feel about the lead singer of live. Um, also, it's weird that the guy became a born-again Christian and sold his, sold his record. I mean, I guess it's not weird. I guess they do that all the time, but... You know, Melancholy and Infinite Sadness is a beautiful work of art. I'm sorry you missed out on it. Um, okay, look at all these. Oh, this one looks interesting. Do you ever find yourself talking to other musicians who are not grounded in rock guitar that do not think some of the newer DSP pedals are all that new or unique? I can do this in Ableton Yawn. You know, I, I actually have not had a lot of conversations like that. I, I don't really try to... I mean, I guess I don't talk to people about pedals in real life that much. Like, I'm on forums. I'm, I talk to you guys. But if I'm not doing an Ask Me Anything and you're not reading something I wrote on a forum, I, I'm probably not standing somewhere talking to somebody having a conversation like this. Um, I also didn't know your question was going to be about pedals. I only read the first few words of a question before I put it on the screen. Very dangerous way to live. So I thought this was going to be like talking to musicians who are not rock musicians and whether there's like differences across genre or something. I mean, it's a fine question, Brandon. I'm, I'm not, I'm not criticizing the question. I'm just saying I wasn't prepared for it. Uh, even though the production mix is super polished, this is actually a strong point of your original music to me. I think the fact that you've studied the great songwriters of yesteryear really shows. Wow. Thanks for acting gray. Thank you. I love you. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, I mean, I spent some real money on the record to go to a real studio and like hire a producer and like, you know, I, I tried to make the best. I, I spent some money on the record so that it would sound good. Uh, but I, thanks. Yeah, I also spent a lot of time trying to make songs cool. I, um, I, uh, when I, the first real band I ever put together, I was like a senior in high school and I convinced all the guys in my little town who were older and better than me to join my band. Like these, you know, the one guy was like the drummer that my previous drummer friends had looked up to. And the guitarist was like the hot shot 12th grader when I was in ninth grade who like won the talent show. And I convinced these guys to join my band. And the, the hot shot guitar player was also the singer. And he was also the main songwriter. And uh, I, I could play like if I took a solo, it would be like, OK, that guy's good. But I, I wasn't really able to put songs together. And this guy was. And so the band kind of lived on his contributions because he had the songs and he was singing them and then he quit. And the band like tried to go on after that. We were like auditioning new singers. But in the meantime, I was like, we can't, we have no songs now because the songwriter left. And I realized then that I was going to have to like take this on myself. I didn't want to ever have, be in the position of losing a songwriter again. What I wish I had also taken on was being the singer. I was like, I, I can't take on both. Little did I know that I would be forced to take on both later in life. Um, so anyway, thank you, thank you for your comment. Uh, what would be your four pedals for a four pedals only pedal board? Uh, you know, the source audio stuff. That you can do a lot with the source audio, especially if you have the pedals that come with like the software shit. There's like a lot of different distortions. A lot of di the synth pedal has a million different effects in there. I, I feel like with the source audio synth and the source audio ultra wave, because the ultra wave, I think, is just like every distortion ever. 
I, I mean, I know it's not every distortion ever. Like I'm sure they didn't put in like a, you know, whatever, like they didn't try to clone a clone or clone a tube screaming. They did their own thing. But from what I know, I just have a hunch that you could probably dial in whatever kind of distortion you needed if you were willing to menu dive. So I feel like um, those two could probably get me a lot. And I think the ultra wave also has like compression options. And then maybe the Strymon timeline, because there's a delay that could do everything I need, but then the timeline can do a million other things. It can do a whammy pedal pitch effect. It can do a ring mod thing. I have a video about the timeline. I'm talking about the stuff I show you in that video. So that I could do a lot with that. Um, what's that, three? And then, um, you know, I don't know. What's like a good sort of random weird one, like the mood maybe? I don't know. I don't know. It's a good one. You got me. All right. Let's go back to the free submitted questions. Um, oh, I, there's one I wanted to do. Hold on. There was here. This is a good one. Oh, this is from Stephen Beyer, who I think is like also in the chat. Um, how do you know when a song is done, uh, both written and mix wise? That's a great question. The answer is different for the two parts of this. I'll start with mix wise. Well, for my real songs that are like on my albums, I, I actually try to, I just, I don't mix those. I give them to somebody. In the past, it's been my producer. But I, I try to do that so that it's not my problem. You know, I try to hire somebody who is good and that I respect and look up to so that like they can mix it. And then I don't, you know, they'll think it's done and then I'll listen to it and maybe I'll agree. I, you know, sometimes I do have edits. I'll be like, I, I want the background voices to be higher. Or like, you know, I want to, it'll be something like that. But, and I'm sure I've driven, I've, I'm sure that I've driven some producers crazy and some mastering engineers crazy with my revision notes. I'm, I'm sure what I'm about to say isn't as true as I'd like it to be. But, but I actually try not to have a million mixed notes. And also, here's a little pro tip for anybody watching at home. Like, if you hire someone to mix your record and, and you, you're having like multiple rounds back and forth of mix revisions and you're like writing lots of long emails where like at two minutes and 13 seconds, we want the hi hat to be a little higher. If you're writing shit like that, so you're doing it wrong. Or you hired a, you hired someone who's terrible, but if you any professional mix artist who's like a real guy who has real credits, like just give them a chance to be right. Like it's your material, but th that means sometimes that you actually sort of can't hear it the way anyone else will. So one, if you get a mix that sounds all wrong, you should like listen to it and live with it for a week because you're used to hearing a version of this in your mind. And that's like no way to work. You know what I mean? Like th the version of it in your mind is just always going to play tricks on you. So live with the mix first before you really send it back for revisions. And then when you send it back, like, I don't know. I, I just feel like if you if you have a million notes that and you've gone back a bunch of times and then the third revision now, the issue is that at 413, you know, the bassist does something cool and you want that to be louder. You either hired someone who's inept or you yourself are just out of control. Um, so I guess the real answer to the question here is in, in terms of mix, I, I just, I try to give that away and have it be someone else's problem. And then I try to have like a really tiny amount of notes that is not me being insane. And then I try to just let it be done, you know? So that's that. And then song wise, um, how do you know when something is done? Well, if, believe it or not, even though I spent all my time doing pedal shit, um, I actually try to make songs work just on the level of like strumming and singing. Like you just play the song unplugged on an unplugged electric guitar, like not even an acoustic guitar. Cause that'll almost sound too realistic. Like play it on an unplugged electric guitar, which doesn't sound like anything and sing it and see if you can get through the whole song and have it more or less make sense. Like there was a verse and a chorus and a bridge and whatever. If you can do that, then the song is probably done. You know, the one we were talking about melancholy and the infinite sadness before. One cool thing about that record is that you can listen to all of Billy Corgan, or I don't know if you can listen to all of them, but many 
of Billy Corgan's demos are available. And he just plays plays the songs and sings them with one mic on an acoustic guitar, including some songs that are like you would think of as pretty distorted, like riff, ty- titanic riff electric guitar songs. Like there's a demo of Here Is No Why that's just him strumming and singing it. And you can tell like, it, yeah, it kind of works on that level. It, it works on the level of these are the chords and this is the melody that goes over the chords. And if you just perform it on that level, does it kind of work? And, and if it does, then I would say it's done. And now all you have to do is just record it. But at this point, it's almost more like you're covering. It's like you're covering someone else's song. It's like the song was written by some songwriter and you've got the chord chart in a book and you know what the lyrics are. And now you can do whatever you want with it. What's, you know, if you could do a really cool, funny, interesting cover of it, what would that sound like? So that's how I try to come at it. Um, oh, look at this. Hey, man, just dropping by. How you doing from the Zapper? Doing well, Zapper. Thanks for dropping by. I feel like you probably left this comment like 15 minutes ago. I'm sure you're gone by now. Um, or maybe you're not. Got any plans to mess with the Source Audio Ultra? You know, I, I would like to do it. I have one. that It would be cool to make a video about that. Um, at the moment, I'm focusing on like some soon-to-be-released stuff. But yes, I would love to do a Source Audio Ultra Wave video. That would be cool. Also, just their stuff in general the cries out for how to be advanced oh look at this um new album coming anytime soon from henry ve man thank you for putting pressure on me i love that you're impatient for my next album to come out that means so much to me thank you anytime soon I, you know i'm worried that the answer is no i'm i don't know i don't maybe not this year i'm still writing all the songs i'm still doing the thing i just said where you make see if the song can work only on the level of strumming acoustic bullshit and singing. I'm still getting through the songs that I want to put on the album on that level. And I've finished maybe like six out of 10. Uh, and then I got to sing it and record it. The recording is going to be easy and singing is going to be hard. I'm a little bit nervous about doing that. Also, part of me feels like I should just build the channel. Cause like, if I put the record out, I want people to hear it. And I feel like nobody's going to hear it unless my YouTube following gets bigger. And the only way for my YouTube following to get bigger is to do more pedal videos. So I, I've a little bit given my permission um, to like focus on growing the YouTube channel this year and focus on writing the songs in the meantime. And then next year, I'll worry about singing it and releasing it. Um, you sound like a great teacher, actually. Do you teach in person also? Thanks. I do. Yeah. Well, I... It depends on what you mean by in person. I, I teach Zoom guitar lessons. I have Zoom people who find me through YouTube. Um, you can send me an email if you want to talk about that. I, I can give Zoom guitar lessons. I, I It's Zoom, so I know it's imperfect. I know in person is better. Um, but if you'd be up for Zoom, you should email me and we can talk about it. And then if you're in New York City, then yes, we could do outside of Zoom too. So I do teach. Thank you for saying I sound like a great teacher. I appreciate that. I, I do teach. Um, so I, you know, I'd love to, um, I would love to teach more people. Can I request the next Tropicana episode, get priority treatment? Thanks. I know. Yeah, I got, I have a lot to report on the Tropicana saga. Thank you for the reminder. I got to do the next Tropicana episode. I promise you this next Tropicana episode is coming out before the album for, for better, for worse, you'll get the next Tropicana album, the next Tropicana show, uh, sooner than the album. When is my dad coming back with the cigarettes? What a dark joke to make. <laughs> what a dark joke to make. Listen, man, I'm, I'm, if this is how you're processing the fact that your dad walked out on your family, I'm sorry that happened to you. I, I would say sooner or later, you're going to have to confront the trauma and you're not just not just make little jokes on other people's YouTube live streams. It doesn't offend me, but I'm just saying like this is not the route to uh, to coming to peace with it. Um, all right, let me do some more. There's some more questions I got from it just submitted in advance that I want to do. Um, get this huge one. I'm going to have to put this in two parts. All right. If you were to live the rest of your life with the ability to turn into one of the super smash brothers characters from the original N64 game, who would you turn into ground rules? No crime fighting necessary. You live in the normal reality we inhabit now and claiming ignorance of the characters based on your early console preferences is inappropriate 
do your homework, Nicholas Mitchell. Well, a couple of things I got to say about this. Uh, first of all, Nicholas Mitchell, I appreciate how carefully you've constrained the question. You know, sometimes people ask me questions and I have follow up questions. None this time because you really set the framework very precisely. So good for you for doing that. Also, let's just take a second to zoom in on the part where you say, I can't claim ignorance of the characters based on my early pref console preference. You think I'm too fucking old for Nintendo 64? <laughs> you, you think I'm so much of a decrepit old that I missed the original Super Smash Brothers? The original Super Smash Brothers is the only Super Smash Brothers game I know. N64 is a huge part of my life. Right? How old are you that you think Nintendo 64 is not an early console? If someone here should be self-conscious about how old they are, it's clearly you. <laughs> anyway, so, so maybe I maybe went a little bit further than I needed to there. Sorry. Uh, I'm just trying to say that I'm quite familiar with the Nintendo 64 Super Smash Brothers. So I, there's no, no one's going to be claiming ignorance. Um, the, the character I used when I was playing was Samus. So Samus comes to mind. I loved it. Also, that would be cool to be able to get the Samus suit. You know, her suit was fucking awesome. I would love to have that suit. Um, I also feel like maybe there's some resemblance to Ness. I tried to use Ness in the game, but he was like too technical. I was never that good. But, you know, Ness has that baseball hat, and I have a red baseball hat that says Six Flags on it. It's a vintage red Six Flags baseball hat. I feel like that's sort of like something Ness would wear. And also the fact that in Ness's own game, he goes on this like incredible adventure through suburbia. Like clearly that's something I can relate to. I, I, I've tried to make every video on my YouTube channel feel like you're on this sort of bizarre side quest through suburbia. So I feel like Ness is the answer where like maybe my life wouldn't change that much. Um, and Samus is the answer where like it would be fucking cool to have that suit. And then also... Um, you know, then Donkey Kong. I just feel like it would also be sort of cool to just become Donkey Kong and fuck shit up. In Mario Kart, in Nintendo 64 Mario Kart, uh, I was always Donkey Kong. I was really good at battle. I am really good at battling Mario Kart. The, the Me and the guys I lived with in college got so good at Mario Kart battle for Nintendo 64 that I honestly felt like I was in the NBA of, of, of people who can play Mario Kart battle i'm talking about like sometimes people would come over we lived off campus and we had an n64 with mario kart in it and sometimes people would come over and be like oh you guys want to play mario kart and we would just look at each other and be like oh yeah all right and then we would play battle and like people would get so wrecked that like they would on they would like lose all three balloons and like within a minute and people would be like how did that happen i don't understand where how you even did that we had like techniques we discovered like the the original how to be advanced was like shit i was learning about how to kill people in mario kart battle and i was always donkey kong he was my guy so part of me has always felt an affinity for donkey kong the part of your question i don't like is that fighting crime is not required i just i feel like it should be required you know with great power comes great responsibility how many fucking times have we heard that i guess i believe it especially if i picked samus i feel like if i have the samus suit and i'm not fighting crime then I'm just some billionaire shithead. You know what I mean? Like I get the Samus suit and all I do is like fly around my backyard and I'm not trying to help anybody. Like that, to me, that reminds me of like Jeff Bezos flying in the rocket to go to space because he felt like it. And then he's like, well, I don't understand why people aren't happier for me. It's like, we don't give a shit. Like you went to space. Like who gives a shit, man? Like if my, if my friend wants to show me pictures of his vacation, I don't really care. You know what I mean? When your buddy's like, hey, look at this picture of me in Cancun. It's on my phone. Like, you don't give a shit. So why would you give a shit that some guy you don't know who just has a billion dollars went on a vacation to the other side of the atmosphere? Th that to me is who you are if you have Samus' suit and you're not fighting crime. So I don't, I reject that part of the question. Um, I, I don't like that part. So I, I guess what I'm saying here is that I would be, I would use the Samus suit and then I would go out there and you know, find some incel guys trying to cause trouble and beat the shit out of them. Um, all right. Uh, what else we got going on here? Uh, 
you guys are talking about the ecosystem. I don't have that yet. I'm sorry. You guys know more about this than I do. You guys know more about most pedals than I do. I, I have very few pedals besides the ones you've seen me make videos for. Like, however many videos are on my YouTube channel about pedals, I have that many pedals plus like three. So if you don't, if I don't have a video about it, I, I maybe don't know what you're talking about. Um, uh, all right, let me see. There's some more advanced questions I got that I got to get through. Oh, yeah, here's a cool one from Michael Wilcox. That guy shows up at these a lot. Have you ever gotten the sense that meeting your musical heroes would be a, a terrible idea? You know, I actually don't think meeting them is the terrible idea. I just think worshiping them is the terrible idea. I, I think it's okay to meet them and also even be like disappointed or disillusioned by them. I, I think that's all fine. And I, I also think it's okay to just like, be, you know, be a fan or be excited about how much you like the thing you're a fan of and like fantasize about what it would be like to meet them. I think that's all okay. But just, you know, try not to worship them. And the other thing too is like, especially if you're have ambitions beyond just being a hobbyist, if, if like you want to be a big star or a professional musician someday or whatever, you know, if you worship the people you look up too much, You'll, you'll just be giving yourself imposter syndrome later. You'll just be sort of thinking, well, I don't really belong here because like the people who belong here are geniuses like Stevie Wonder. Now, you know, that Stevie Wonder is a genius and he's, he's probably more talented than you. But most of the people who are successful in the world are less talented than Stevie Wonder. So look at it that way. Like, belonging to the people who are less talented than Stevie Wonder Club is a good club. Like a lot of people have diamond records who are less talented than Stevie Wonder. If you're in the same club as them, you know, I like John Mellencamp and John Mellencamp, I think is less talented than Stevie Wonder. It would honestly surprise me if John Mellencamp himself was insulted by what I just said. And guess what? Like me and John Mellencamp are both in the less talented than Stevie Wonder Club. So Good news, and so are you, whoever's watching this. You know, so good news. Like you, me, and John Mellencamp can all wake up tomorrow and be like, well, you know, John Mellencamp is waking up and he's working on his next record. You know, so can I. So, uh, you know, there's a part of me that wants to say I worship Stevie Wonder, and I do, but not to the point that I think that I'm disqualified from being a musician and not to the point that I would, like, have to quit music or something if I met Stevie Wonder and he spit on my face, it would affect me. I'm thinking about that now. It would affect me. But I would wake up the next day and be like, man, oh, imagine, imagine the stones you'd have to have to have Stevie Wonder spit in your face and not quit music after that. Imagine what a tough guy you'd have to be. And then I would just have to be that tough guy. That's how I face my problems. Uh, all right. What else? We, we, um, I don't have any boss pedals except the TU3. Well, cool, man. You are the highest level of person who could be watching my YouTube channel. <laughs> if you're a guy who's watching my pedal videos and the only pedal you have is a tuner, my tip my hat to you. C clearly, you've been following with close attention what the real message of all my videos is. Kudos to you. Um, all right, here's, another, here's a quick one I can just bang out. See, don't ever let anybody say that I did not attend to the people who submitted questions in advance. Have you ever used a bass six and would you treat it like a trebly bass or a bassy lead guitar from C.B. Mullen? C.B. Mullen sounds like the author of children's books. You know what I mean? With us, ladies and gentlemen, is the Caldecott winner C.B. Mullen here to tell us about what inspired his latest children's book. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I said before that I have an issue with children's music. No one should take that to me that I have an issue with children's books. The children's books are fine. I'm, I'm not morally insulted by children's books the way I am quite morally insulted by children's music. So all this is to say that C.B. Mullen, I'm, I'm not making fun of you when I say that your name reminds me of a children's book author's name. I'm not, I mean, I'm not giving you a compliment either. I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you what I think about what your name is. Uh, now to answer your question, um, I've never even played a bass six and I'm not that good at playing bass, but, uh, how would I use it? Would I use it like a trebly bass or a bassy lead guitar? I probably would not. 
I look at the sorry, we're, I'm gonna come back to the question. Anthony's Big Snow Day by <laughs> Anthony's Big Snow Day O by CB Mullen. That's good. Wrapped in gray. That's really funny. Anthony's Big Snow Day O by CB Mullen. That's like if you took those red hot chili peppers lyrics and adapted it into a children's book. That's what it would be. That's really funny. Good job, Wrapped in Gray. Um uh, okay, back to the question. I, yeah, I've never played one. I think I, I probably would not use it as a basic lead guitar. I, I feel like that I just I'm imagining how that would sound and I, I think it would sound kind of dumb if you like tried to play a solo on a bass six the way a lead guitarist would play a solo. I've played with bass players who play bass like guitar players and I, I think they're bad. I, and I think they're like they don't understand what instrument they chose. It's like a dereliction of duty. You know what I mean? You 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 could have picked anything and you picked bass. So play the fucking bass. Uh so when I imagine playing a bass six as a bassy lead guitar, it like reminds me of those kinds of players, and I don't like that. Um, I think what I would do is that I would like try to get the trebliest. I would like put it through a like a distorted amp or like a big muff and like really make it sort of harsh and trebly, and then double check that over like a real sub bass sound. Like maybe just get a synth and play some really simple like sub sine waves and then double that part with the bass six through a distortion pedal. That in my mind sounds really good right now. Can you make uh, how to be advanced about boss tuners? I I've thought about it. I I've really thought about it. I think that would be so hysterical. I would love to do something like that. The, the hard part is getting to five pro tips for, for better, for worse. I feel like, um, I've, I've like developed this format now and the format is the brand. And so it has to be five pro tips and I can't do it if it's less than five. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Would you guys feel like something, if I put out a video that was how to be advanced and it was two pro tips, would you guys feel like, ooh, something's wrong? Or would you be like, oh, two pro tips, nice. <laughs> um, yeah, the hardest part is getting to five pro tips, but I would love to make a tuner video. I think that'd be hysterical. All right, um, we're, we're like sort of at the end here. If you have any more any more uh, questions in the chat, get them out now. Otherwise, I'm just going to plow through the rest of my submitted advanced questions and we're going to be done. What's your favorite overdrive pedal? Well, the one I've used the longest is the Boss Super Overdrive. I also think the Boss DS1 sounds good. I know this is a distortion pedal, but if you just use it as an overdrive, I, I think that's fine. Um, and then the distortion I use on my board is the MHX 5150 which is really more of a distortion than an overdrive. But I love that pedal. That's the Eddie Van Halen distortion effect, the 5150. That pedal's incredible. Um, you can record direct from that pedal, and it sounds good. Like you, I'm, I'm serious. You just take that pedal, and the output of that pedal goes into your recording console. No amp, no microphone. Like It, it sounds good. Um, that's a distortion. It's not an overdrive. Also, it doesn't matter what overdrive pedal you use. I'm not kidding. It, it literally doesn't matter. Like you could buy any overdrive pedal that's ever been made and it's it's basically going to be the same as every other overdrive pedal that's ever been made. And if if you think there's something wrong with your overdrive pedal, it, it there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> you, you just got to you just got to practice a little better. Um Oh yeah, here's a good one. Uh do you spend a lot of time mastering or do you keep it quick and raw by sad boy guitars? I don't master my own stuff. I mean, for my records, I, I give those to a mastering engineer. I think it's really important to have other people's ears that are good at what they do on your record. So that's why I, I don't, when I, when I have to make an album and I'm releasing an album that is cyber attack or one of my old bands or whatever, I, I want to hire a producer I, I don't want us to mix it. I want the, either the producer or someone else to mix it. And then I want someone else and st still not the producer to master it. I, I just think it's good to use professionals for this. And it's good to have people who are not going to have your ears. Um, you know, I, I also, I, I've never really, the only, I, 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 I think a little bit did drive one mastering engineer crazy once because I, I, I kept writing back with revisions for the gaps between the songs. I, w I once kind of went nuts and it was probably sort of a nightmare client having to do with the space between songs and the fade ins and the fade outs. Aside from that though, when it comes to like the compression and the volume shit that they're doing and the EQ shit that they're doing, I, I just feel like hire someone who's good at their job and then don't worry about that. Then 
um, if you, you know, I'm not even making any attempt to master the little songs that are in my pedal videos. I, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not doing anything that I would consider to be mastering with that, with that process. Um, maybe a little collection of various pedals in the same effects family would be nice to have those tips available. Do you mean make a video where it's just sort of like delay pedals, how to be advanced? If so, I've been thinking about doing that. I think the first one might be ring modulators. I've had some ideas for a while about how to make a video that would just be called like ring modulation, how to be advanced. Um, so if that's what you meant, good news for you. I, I plan to do that. Um, all right. I, oh yeah. Here, look at this one. I missed this one. This is one. If I, if I had not missed this one earlier, I would have spent a huge amount of time on this from Andrew Masterman is free will just an illusion. <laughs> uh, I've actually like thought about this a little bit. Um, I think it's not an illusion. I think free will is real. I, I've actually, I don't, I mean, this is like a real question that philosophers spend time on. Like you can go to graduate school and like become a professional expert in this question. I'm not. Um, but I think it is real. There's a philosopher named Daniel Dennett, who you might've heard of. As far as philosophers go, he's famous. That does not mean that he's a famous person. It just means that as far as philosophers go, he's famous. Um, he's written about this. And I think he's basically right. He He's written books about why free will is real, even if there are certain things that what might make it seem like it's not real. Like in a world where we can sort of make perfect scientific predictions about how every particle would interact with every other particle in the world, in, including all the particles that were present at the moment of the Big Bang, up through and including every particle that's in your brain, uh, how could free will exist in a world like that? And he, he has an answer, and I, I think it's persuasive. His, his books are sort of like intense and hard to follow. I, I read his book about free will where he says free will is real, and the first time I finished it, I was like, I missed the part where he said it was real. I, like, I feel like I finished that book and didn't get it. Then I read it again, or I tried to read it again, and I sort of got it. There's another guy named Sean Carroll who's a physicist, who you also might have heard of because he has a podcast uh, and has written some popular science books. And he's been on the Joe Rogan show or the Joe Rogan experience, excuse me. He's sort of like Sean Carroll is like what guys in the intellectual dark web wish they were. Like he, he's, I think he, he's one of these guys who's like very smart in his field, which is physics. And then also has some commentary on popular subjects outside his field, including social issues which is like sort of what the intellectual dark, what the Weinstein brothers are all about and what many of Joe Rogan's guests are about. But I think Sean Carroll is like, unlike most IDW guys, not full of shit. And is, is like, I, I'll say this. I'm, I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about what I think about some of this shit. Um, I think a lot of like edgy public intellectuals right now, are actually more committed to saying stuff you're not supposed to say than saying stuff that's actually right or true. Like if there's something you're not supposed to say, they want to say it because they think it's important for the health of the Republic and the free marketplace of ideas and free speech. And, it, you know, we should always be on the lookout for what the powers that be don't want you to say. And so anything you're not supposed to say, it's actually valuable to say it. I, I feel like that's where a lot of intellectual dark web guys are sort of coming from. And Sean Carroll said, like, that's actually not at all where I'm coming from. Where I'm coming from is I think we should just say stuff that we think is right and true. And it doesn't matter if you're supposed to say it or not. It, that's, it actually doesn't matter whether you're supposed to say something. It, it only matters whether what you're saying is right or wrong. And, and that's what we should care about if we're going to be intellectual. We should care about saying stuff that's right. And if it's wrong, we should then stop saying it. Um, so I like Sean Carroll. And the reason I'm talking about this is that he wrote a book called The Big Picture that is also about why free will is real. And it's just easier to follow than Daniel Dennett's book. He's basically making the, the same kind of argument, but he's making it without like professional philosopher academic rigor. He's just like trying to write a book that you could like buy at Barnes and Noble and follow. And when I read his book, I was like, oh, I get it now. Yeah. Okay. I agree. I think free will is real. So uh, this is extremely nerdy. I'm so glad that we're ending the AMA on this. The, the reason why I fuck with these ideas at all 
as I mean, it's as I'm really nerdy about myself. <laughs> when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, I went to a summer camp that was like only for nerds. It was literally called the Center for Talented Youth. It was like they gave it a name that was like, we're going to make sure that you get beaten up at school when people find out you're doing this. We're going to try to come up with a name that will just force you to get the shit kicked out of you on the playground when you're when the kids who go to school find out that you're going here this summer. And the name we came up with is the Center for Talented Youth. So it was basically like summer school that you choose to go to and you like live in a college dorm and you take a class. And you like study this thing for three weeks and like a college campus over the summer. I, this, I did this repeatedly as a teenager. That's what, what a dork I was. Um, and one of, the, uh, one, of the, one of the courses I took was existentialism. <laughs> I took a summer course that was just called existentialism. <laughs> I was like 16. Um, and it was extremely dorky, but you also got to understand it was a total sex fest also because all the kids at this thing were basically like the Lisa Simpsons of their school. And then we got us all together on a, on like a college campus and there was nothing to do when we weren't taking our little class. So, you know, people made out a lot. I, my first like real, the first love of my life was somebody I met at this, at the center for talented youth. So, uh, so anyway, one of the classes I took at this extremely geeky thing that I did was about free will. That's where I learned about Daniel Dennett. Um, all right. Well, cool. I'm glad that uh, me sharing that extremely geeky story about my past um, ended all the chat engagement. That's exactly the effect I wanted. Um, oh, and look at this. Somebody gives a Rush quote. If you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice from Rush. That's really funny. Yeah, so that's true. It's true that if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. But that's a really good example of like lyrics that I think are not very lyrical. Like there's just no way to sing a line like that and have it sound good. And if you think Rush did it, they didn't do it. And it does not sound good. If you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. <laughs> like that's how they sing it. And it's this just sounds bad. Like there are certain, this is the real last thing I'll say. There are certain lyrics that you like, I think you can just look at and sort of tell, like, well, you're not really gonna be able to sing that in a way that'll sound good. And it doesn't matter whether the lyric is like true or not. It's just like, does it have like a certain, that quality? You know what I mean? Like sometimes love don't feel like it should, you make it hurt so good. That's a perfect example of a lyric that is very lyrical. Like when John Mellencamp thought of that, he hit it out of the park. If you look in your notebook of lyrics and you see the sentence, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. I think you can just tell from a mile away that that song is going to sound like shit. And I think that song does sound like shit. But again, what do I know? You know, Rush was a very successful band. They sold a lot of records and went on a lot of tours and reached a lot of people. And clearly people watching this video like Rush because they can't shut the fuck up about it every time I do one of these AMAs. You know, Rush has reached a lot more lives than me and my 6,000 YouTube subscribers. So they're right and I'm wrong. But, you know, it's my show. And I'm, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it like I see it. Okay. Um, thank you everybody for being a part of the AMA. I, uh, I, I love doing these. Um, I look forward to doing more of these soon. Thanks also for supporting the channel. Um, if you want to just play my videos for other people that, you know, that always helps even more than like liking and subscribing or whatever. Just if you know anybody who you think would like the videos, you want to show them to them. Uh, it does help. Thanks very much, everybody. This has been a real joy and I'll see you next time.